Starship crew awakens in freshly cloned bodies to discover someone murdered them all in their previous lives and the killer must be at least one of them in six wakes. That's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining me. Thomas here, your host as always. Now Six Wakes is pretty darn good. Now this makes me happy because of how intensely disappointed I was in Mer Lafferty's first novel, the urban fantasy Shambling Guide to New York City, a book which came out shortly after Lafferty's Campbell Award win and which tried to do just about everything, most of it poorly. Now you could also accuse Six Wakes of trying to do everything, or at least more than it needs to, but it does all of its moreness to much better effect. Now what's most impressive is how Lafferty has constructed a science fiction murder mystery in which the science fictional elements are inseparable from the mystery. Now I've read my share of SF mysteries, which are simply regular mysteries that happen to be set in the future or on some orbital colony or something like that, but which could just as easily have been taking place in a bodega in modern-day Southern California. But Six Wakes places its mystery within the context of a future society about four centuries down the road in which human life extension is routinely achieved by cloning. Now, people die and their old bodies are discarded and their mind maps are simply installed in a new body. Governing all of this procedure is a collection of laws called the codicils, which ensure that cloning is done under what can be called entirely reasonable ethical guidelines. You can't make multiple copies of yourself. Now that's a good one, considering how many people cause enough problems in life with only one of them around. Now you can't plug the wrong mind into the wrong body, and most importantly, you can't hack a person's mind map to do the Gattaca thing and create a tricked out modified version of yourself. Now if you guess this is the one law most commonly broken, you'd be right. Now the codicils are at the core of this story, and if they superficially resemble Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, well, you wouldn't be the first to remark upon it. Asimov created his famous laws, and then concocted a whole series of stories to explore situations in which they might fail, or at least prove to be less helpful in solving problems than their written intent implied. The robot stories were thought experiments, which is what much of the best hard SF tries to be. Mer Lafferty hasn't attempted quite the same thing, but her story offers similar food for thought. For one thing, in a future where anyone can re-up themselves after death with a fresh young body, does the act of murder carry the same moral weight? Moreover, where does an individual's personal responsibility begin or end if their minds have in fact been hacked, interfered with, and they've been deliberately remade into sociopaths who harm others simply because it's no longer in their natures not to and through no choice of their own. Now the book comes down quite squarely on the side of believing that cloning does not erase the need for a moral compass or even simple empathy, and it also seems to argue that our ability to extend our lives through technology doesn't take away the value life has always had for us by virtue of being both short and, well, a one-time offer. The Dormeyer is a colony ship ferrying thousands of people in cold sleep, as well as hundreds of stored clone mind maps, towards a habitable world orbiting Tau Ceti. The crew consists of six people, Katrina the captain, Wolfgang second in command, uh, pilot and navigator Hiro, Paul the engineer, medical officer Joanna, and Maria Arena, who is responsible for general maintenance. As the book opens, all six of them are awakening in clone vats only to make the horrific discovery that their previous selves had all been horribly murdered, with the exception of Hiro, who's found hanging by possible suicide in the bridge, and Katrina, whose previous body is comatose in the medical bay. Now this presents a clear legal problem, as older versions of clones cannot remain alive once a new clone has been awakened. But there's a good reason to keep old Katrina around, as she may provide the only clue to the carnage. You see, whoever committed the murders did much more. Everyone's mind maps are gone, and the ship's AI has been deactivated. No one has any memory of the voyage after the actual launch, despite the fact they've definitely been underway for years and years. So any one of them could have done it, and one of them must have. 
a worry compounded by the fact that all six of them have extensive criminal pasts and have taken their crew positions as a way of clearing their records. At least the cargo is safe. What unfolds from here is a slick and smoothly paced science fiction crime novel that expands well beyond a whodunit. Now, without giving too much away, what we find is a story that explores just what a profound impact life extension cloning will have on humanity at large, leading, as per human nature, towards greater conflict, fear, bigotry, and violence. The gift of greatly extended, if not eternal, life won't be met by everyone as a gift, especially not when there are legitimate fears that what comes out of the vat may no longer be you. Should the wealthy and powerful decide they have a use for you and have no scruples about remaking you in their image to suit their ends. Fans of John Scalzi's lock-in should take to this, but Six Wakes has an accessibility that should win a broad overall readership. Its biggest problem is that, like so many stories that pile conspiracies on top of conspiracies, after a while, it all gets so labyrinthine your head may swim. But a lot of crime fiction, in my experience, is like that. So the best way to enjoy Six Wakes, I found, was to stop trying to flowchart the insane maze the plot was becoming and just go with it, because it would all be explained eventually. Which it is, I might add, in a satisfying way. So, yes, it's all a bit much after a while, but I greatly enjoyed the ride. And a few of my guesses as to the solution of the whole mystery were even right. So... Mischief Managed. And that is all I've got time for on this episode of SFF 180. Thank you all again for joining me. Remember the most important thing, these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you have not done so, that is how SFF 180 grows as a channel. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where all of my lovely patrons, the Recruits and Winks Army, get to watch Mailbag Monday one day early on Sunday afternoon. So thank you all so much again for your support, and until I see everybody next time, happy reading.